Hello, Geography 232 students. Welcome to week eight of our class on analysis and modeling. This week, we're going to be talking about LIDAR data. This is a, a part one of a two part series on LIDAR data. This will be considered the introduction. Uh, I know last week's lecture, we briefly talked about LIDAR data in the context of just how it relates to DEMs and DSMs. Uh, so this week, we're going to get into LIDAR data in, in full, uh, and then we will continue this uh, in our next lecture as well. Uh, so let's get going. The agenda for this week, lecture, LIDAR data, part one, introduction. Uh, this week's lab will be extract 3D buildings from LIDAR data. And upon completion of this lecture and lab, you should know how to explore the properties and statistics of a LIDAR data set. And LAS is the um, native format for LIDAR data in ArcGIS Pro, uh, create and classify a LiDAR data set, conduct an interactive surface analysis using point cloud data, and finally extract a digital elevation model from LiDAR data. And you are now familiar with DEMs and DSMs, so you know what a digital elevation model is and you know how it's created and you're gonna actually create one yourself this week. A quick outline, introduction to LiDAR, and there's a video that I want everybody to watch. I suppose that would be a video within a video. So in your lecture notes, go ahead and click the link for the specific video. And I will also link to it from our YouTube video as well. Part two, uh, system components, data collection, and LiDAR products. Intro to LiDAR. So the LiDAR name, sometimes you'll see it uh, stylized as capital L LiDAR, or the way I do it, uh, L lowercase i capital uh, D A R, or all uppercase L A D R. Anyway, um, it stands for light detection and ranging. And the name is essentially um, an ode to radar, which is radio detection and ranging is obviously a, a much older technology, uh, but a very important technology. Uh, so LiDAR data, essentially, instead of bouncing a sound wave off of an object or surface, it bounces light waves off. All right. So the first LiDAR measurements of the upper atmosphere using a laser transmitter were made in 1963. Radar, radar actually goes all the way back to World War, World War II, so uh, preceded by about 20 years. Uh, LiDAR was in the laboratory phase in the 1960s and in less than 40 years has become an invaluable component of remote sensing. Uh, so it's primarily developed uh, for military use and things of that sort. And now LiDAR data is actually very, very commonplace. And as I mentioned uh, in, last week, not only are uh, LiDAR consoles flown on, on airplanes and drones, they are also uh, have also been developed to be held by hand, essentially, and uh, walked through interiors of buildings. So we can get a LiDAR model of an inter uh, interior of a building, not just uh, exterior from, from above. Uh, so uh, active remote sensing technology functions in both day and night because, again, it's it's a light beam. Uh, it has no uh, reliance on other sources of light, as i.e. the sun. Uh, it comes from a, a specific uh, generated light source, bounces off the surface, and returns to, to uh, the origin point. And so it can be run in day and night, in dark and in light. Uh, one of the most accurate, suitable, and cost-effective ways to capture wide area elevation information versus ground survey. Uh, the, the primary benefit of LiDAR data is that it can be captured from a distance uh, and at speed as well, because we're talking about uh, essentially the speed of light with a LiDAR sensor. So uh, LiDAR can be flown uh, from very high and capture data fairly quickly as well. LiDAR data is usually collected on a fixed wing aircraft, meaning an airplane versus a like a helicopter, um, and that's what we call airborne survey, but also satellite, terrestrial, and mobile mapping systems are available, as I mentioned. As, as the technology has uh, become more commonplace and proliferated, uh, handheld mobile devices are now available as well. Uh, it utilizes uh, laser light waves up to 150,000 pulses per second, and I think I was trying to drive this point home in last week's lecture. Those 150,000 pulses per second uh, lead to an incredibly high resolution image. Uh, and so instead of your typical uh, DEM uh, derived from an aerial photo where it's perhaps uh, you know a factor of less than uh, 100, um, it's uh, in this case here, it's incredibly high resolution uh, and can lead to very high detail uh, data. Uh, 
So it's highly sensitive to aerosols and cloud particles and has many applications in atmospheric research and meteorology. So you're not limited to looking at what's on the ground. Uh, it can also be used uh, for tracking uh, weather phenomena such as rain, snow, sleet, hail, things like that. Uh, and LiDAR cannot penetrate water from the air. Uh, so fully, cl fully closed canopies, snow, rain, clouds, water, they all uh, present an obstruction to LiDAR data. Also, high winds obstruct the collection uh, and cannot see if there's smoke. So uh, when, it, when it comes to high wind, uh, there is something known as an IMU, which I'll talk about shortly, that can actually uh, sort of control for high winds and for turbulence. But ultimately, there are limitations to, to the LiDAR uh, system. So LiDAR is a fast emerging technology for determining the shape of the ground surface plus natural and man-made features such as buildings, trees, and power lines. Uh, and so not only does it track, uh, we'll say, ground surface features like rivers, streams, lakes, mountains, coastlines, it can also, uh, with high efficiency and uh, detail, track man-made features as well, such as rooftops, crosswalks, everything as small as a fire hydrant or a power line or something like that. So incredibly high resolution. So data are directly processed in GIS to produce detailed bare earth DEMs at accuracies of from nine to 18 centimeters vertically and 15 to 15 centimeters to one meter horizontally. And those um, resolutions are increasing uh, over, by, by the year. All right, so at this point, you can pause this video, open up your lecture notes, uh, and click the link there, or um, you can also scroll up or scroll down on your video here and click the link in the description. And this will link to a video from the uh, National Science Foundation. All right. So now you know quite a bit more about LiDAR data than when we started. Hopefully you found that video interesting, uh, and now you know the difference between an IMU and an EMU. All right, so LiDAR system components. Um, one component is the laser rangefinder. That is the actual instrument that emits the LiDAR pulses, the actual pulses of light. It records the distance to the target uh, with this formula T times C divided by 2, where T is equal to time uh, times the speed of light divided by 2, because it's both the time it takes to leave the uh, rangefinder, hit the surface, and then return to uh, the range finder. So it's um, C divided by 2. So time, uh, the target is time times the speed of light divided by 2. Uh, and so we know that the speed of light is incredibly fast, 299,792,458 meters per second, also 186,000 miles uh, per second. Uh, so it's incredibly fast. And so that leads to these high resolution outputs because the time it takes to leave the rangefinder, hit the surface, and return is so quick, it can send out the next one uh, literally uh, immediately after. So uh, that's one component the laser rangefinder. Uh, laser rangefinder uh, is airborne, airborne LiDAR laser typically operates at 164,000 nanometers, which is in the what we call the near infrared uh, band of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that band, as you will all know by now, is naked, uh, excuse me, uh, invisible to the naked eye. Uh, and so it's near infrared. It's outside that about 400 to 700 range where we can see uh, with our eyes. And so that means that uh, we need special sensors to, to uh, operate to capture those, that, that specific band. Um, underwater LiDAR operates at 532 nanometers, which you may recognize as the green wavelength. Why is that? Well, because green actually has one of the uh, longest distances it can travel uh, through water. All right, so it's a shorter wavelength. A shorter wavelengths travel better through water. Longer wavelengths are often absorbed. Um, and you'll, you'll notice that uh, when you are maybe snorkeling, you'll see that the first colors to disappear from maybe your clothes or from a coral reef are red. Um, so if you, next time you're in Hawaii or someplace, uh, put on a red shirt and dive down below the water and watch the color turn to gray. Essentially, it's, it's quite fascinating. Uh, conversely, green will actually stick around for quite some time. Uh, Self-driving car lasers typically operate at uh, 1,550 nanometers to see 200 meters ahead. So uh, essentially, that's, um, it's better for traveling farther distances versus uh, uh, obviously on the surface versus underwater. 
Uh, another component is a differential GPS or global positioning system that records accurate location within one centimeter of aircraft and laser pulse then it def differentially corrects uh, with a computer. So essentially it's correcting for uh, the, you know, the movement obviously in the aircraft, whatever is collecting the, uh, the samples or the, the, the surface measurements. Um, and then third component is what I had mentioned before, the IMU or the inertial measurement unit. And that measures the orientation, speed, heading, and so on of the sensor on the platform. So it measures those uh, basically coming from the airplane uh, and then it records the pitch, roll, yaw, and so forth from the airplane. And then it uses those to control. So um, as you probably saw in the video, um, nadir, which is directly above a surface, uh, is you know obviously only one specific portion of these measurements. Often those are off nadir, where it will be aiming some degree off of a right angle, um, off of 90 degrees. And so the IMU corrects for those differences. It also measures, you know, the actual uh, path that the airplane takes, whether the, plat the, the airplane is um, completely, you know, uh, horizontal or if it's banking left or right, up or down, so on and so forth. And then it uses those recorded measurements to then go back and essentially control for all of the differences um, uh, over the, the measurements that were taken from the, uh, the rangefinder. Another component is a computer. Obviously, we couldn't do any of this without a computer. So a computer um, records remotely sensed data from the LiDAR sensor. You can kind of think of the computer as essentially a hard drive in this case. Um, and then um, LAS file, point cloud file format of the LAS in that case is short for a laser. Uh, and you'll be exposed to LAS point cloud files shortly when you do the lab. Uh, and then optionally, a digital camera can also be mounted uh, adjacent to the uh, rangefinder and so you can take with that panchromatic multi-spectral uh, images or video uh, and then digital imagery collected simultaneously with lighter data can be combined combined together to make uh, high resolution dsms that are then essentially um, overlaid with the photo the photographs the panchromatic or the multi-spectral images and that can make for essentially what you see with google maps so if you ever open up google maps or google earth you'll see you know zoom into downtown los angeles You'll see there are these tall skyscrapers, very high, highly accurate terrain models or surface models with the actual textures or the, the look of the buildings uh, um, overlaid on top of them. So that's a combination of a panchromatic image overlaid over the actual digital surface model. So this is an early example of a, a LiDAR system from the, night, from the late 90s, and then a newer system on the right. So you can see that obviously the, it looks like the technology has improved drastically over the last uh, 20 years or so. Okay, next up, data collection. How do we actually collect this data? So it really all comes down to two, two keywords, pulses and returns. So the pulse is the burst of light uh, from the LiDAR system. All right, so a pulse of light is sent out and then it reflects off of a surface and the surface uh, return, and in this case here, the term is turn, return, uh, that is what tells the LiDAR system how far away the object is. So that's the return is reflected light energy that's recorded by the LiDAR sensor. And so if it's the first return, it's the very first object that um, the pulse hits. And if it's a later return, second, third, fourth, and so on, then those will be deeper into, we'll say, a tree canopy, or perhaps hitting the surface, or maybe hitting a rooftop below tree canopy, and so on and so forth. So the pulse is the actual a burst of light, and the return is the reflected light going back up to the sensor. So there are actually two different kinds of pulses. We have discrete laser pulses. Those are the most component, excuse me, most common rather. And those are, as the names imply, a single burst of light. Okay, so components, that would be a pulsed laser transmitter, optical telescope receiver that amplifies the backscatter, a photomultiplier tube to convert the optical energy into electrical impulses, and then the distance to ground is calculated using the time and the speed of light divided by two, right? So that's one, and that's the most common. Another is what we call a continuous laser wave, and that transmits a continuous signal. And so instead of individual pulses of light up to 150,000 per second, it's just one single uh, laser beam that just continually scans the Earth, okay? So in this case, ranging is carried out by modulating the intensity of the laser light. So as the laser light hits some sort of a object, some surface, uh, that's going to affect the intensity. And so as light passes through a tree, when it gets to the, we'll say the surface of the earth, the ground, it's going to be a less intense light 
and it's going to record that lower intensity. And then that combined with the first return on the top of the tree is going to tell the sensor how, how dense or how tall a forest, for example, might be. The travel time is directly proportional to the phase difference between the received and transmitted sinusoidal signal, and I will not get into describing what sinusoidal is in this case. All right, so returns. Um, returns, again, as I said before, are reflected light energy from the ground and or objects on the Earth's surface. So it could be natural objects like trees or mountains, rivers, so on and so forth, or it could be man-made objects like, like buildings, right? So here's an example here with this graphic. We can see a first return or an only return. You'll, hear, you'll see that term only returns when a LiDAR system sends out a pulse of light and all it hits is the ground, the bare earth. Maybe it's grass, sand, asphalt, what have you. Um, a first return would be a, a treetop or maybe a roof rooftop. Second return would be the branches beneath the um, top of the canopy. Third return might, might be the ground or uh, you know shrubs below the tree canopy, so on and so forth. So first, second, third just basically uh, implies uh, the first time the pulse hits an object, second time, third time, and so on and so forth. And here we just have a couple of examples. Single return would be the top of the tree or the ground. Multiple returns, first, second, third, fourth, implies top, middle, middle third, and then the bottom. And then in this case here, we can see that the waveform is a, the continuous laser beam. So this is a good example of LiDAR returns. We can see all returns here on the top. Uh, compared to that, you kind of break it down to its component parts. First returns would be the tops of the trees. Second would be kind of the middle tier of the canopy. Third returns might be shrubs beneath the canopy or maybe tree stumps, things like that. And then fourth return uh, might be the bare earth beneath it. And you can see those percentages, right? So 26% are second returns, 4% are third, less than 1% are fourth returns, and all the remainder are first returns. So nearly 80% or so, or 70% rather, um, are first returns. All right, so what are some products that we can pull from a LiDAR point cloud? Well, we've already talked about DEMs and DSMs, so we'll talk about that a bit more and actually how to create them. So the actual raw data of LiDAR itself is known as an LAS file, and an LAZ file is the same, but it's zipped, um, and it's essentially highly compressed. And so if you do have an LAZ file, you have to first decompress the file in order to use it in um, ArcGIS Pro. And it's not just like a typical WinZip decompression. You actually have to use uh, ArcGIS to convert it from zipped to uh, uncompressed. Um, from the raw data, we can create a digital surface model, a DSM, uh, which is the first return, right? So we've talked about surface models, including uh, not just the bare earth, but also natural man-made features on the earth's surface. Well, those, again, man-made and natural features uh, would be captured in the first return, okay? Um, we have digital elevation models, which are the bare earth. Maybe those are fourth returns or also the only returns when there's no objects on the earth's surface. Um, you can also create building footprints which are then convert, converted to vector data or polygons, contours, which are lines or ISO lines, and then tri triangular irregular networks, which I mentioned last week, which are essentially point, uh, point networks that can be triangulated to simulate um, an undulating surface. All right, so the point cloud, as I mentioned before, I think it's a common LiDAR data exchange format. LAS is short for laser, LAZ is a LAS file that is compressed, okay? Uh, and it can be compressed up to 10 times. And you'll notice that when you download an LAZ file, the file size is uh, relatively, you know, it depends on obviously the area, but it's relatively small, we'll say 100 megabytes. Then you unzip that and that could be maybe 500 megabytes or even a gig, okay? So the compression factors are significant. Um, the LAS file stores a variety of point information of the number of returns, uh, the return number, so is it return number one, number two, number three, and so on and so forth, and you can actually classify them by return number. If you just want to see um, a digital surface model, you would just look at return number one. If you want to look at a bare earth, maybe you're looking at return number four, three, four, or, or uh, only returns. Uh, the intensity, uh, X, Y, and Z values, so the actual physical locations on the earth's surface or above the earth's surface. Scan direction, so was this natter or off natter? Classification, as I mentioned before, you can classify first, second, third, fourth. Uh, scan angle rank and uh, GPS time as well. 
Uh, so like multispectral raster imagery, point cloud data can be classified uh, by characteristics. And you'll see uh, classes 0 through 31. A handful, about half of those, are reserved for the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, uh, and they have their own uses for those classes, basically 10 and above. But below 10, we have uh, 0, which is created, never classified, but 1 is unclassified, 2 would be ground, three is low vegetation, four medium vegetation, five high vegetation, and so on and so forth. And so those are essentially set classes for LiDAR data sets. And so because those are essentially the standard class numbers, uh, you can then uh, essentially symbolize data based off those classes. So if you want to see what's water, what are buildings, what's medium vegetation, uh, there's a standard classification system. And then you can actually color a LiDAR data set to sort of simulate uh, what the landscape looks like. And here is a quick example, uh, and this looks like we're actually looking at um, elevation data here, classified by elevation. Obviously, it's it's a build, it's a, it's a neighborhood, Minneapolis, um, but the colors come from the height. Uh, downtown Minneapolis once again, and you can see that those only returns, the ground returns, actually are able to capture uh, even a difference on uh, the the walkways, like the pathways through that quad that quadrangle right there you can see the circular color of the quad and uh, then surrounded by probably grass or maybe a parking lot uh, and so it's able to make out different different colors because as you know uh, different colors and brightnesses have different spectral signatures and so it can still capture those uh, this is uh, the actual LiDAR point cloud. Uh, this is a high intensity point cloud. I mentioned this to you all, I think, in our uh, our time together last Wednesday, uh, that this um, high density point cloud essentially is, it's, it's not really the standard for what's flown from aircraft, but as I had mentioned, a lot of interior usage uh, has now kind of come into play because of the, essentially the increasing quality of this technology. Uh, and so you can take these high density LiDAR systems and they're, they're handheld, so they're a lot smaller. They don't need to be mounted on, on an aircraft. And in this case here, somebody drove or walked down a street and got a very high resolution um, rendering of what that street looked like, including all the building facades and the street signs and even the crosswalk, things like that. But as you can kind of uh, imagine, you can also apply this to the interior of buildings as well, and that you can get floor plans, including you know where furniture and things like that are sort are sited. Uh, you might use this if you are an architect or perhaps an in interior designer or any any sort of planner. So yes, high density point clouds are really kind of the new thing, uh, and that uh, that that detail will just continue to increase as the technology improves. This here is a point cloud showing elevation of all returns. So this would be all returns, uh, one through four in this case. This here would be point cloud showing only last and only returns. So maybe uh, it's it was a four return uh, pulse that went out. This would include only the last ones of those four or only returns, which are those that only have one single return uh, and they're reflecting off of the bare earth. So you can see a couple of like black rectangles uh, on the landscape. Those would be essentially buildings that are would be first returns, and those are those are filtered out because this is only last and only returns. This here is point cloud data with RGB values assigned to points. So as I mentioned before, uh, each of the different landscape types or land cover types, like vegetation, high, medium, low density, um, construction buildings, things like that, those all have classification numbers. And so what you can do is classify by uh, those types and make them kind of a standard color, like green for vegetation, brown for landscape, gray for buildings. And you can get kind of a rough understanding of what the world actually looks like. It may not be an exact representation, but you can kind of uh, use it as an analog for the real world. And this here are uh, return numbers. So return numbers one through four, um, every every surface object gets at least a first return, right? So it's either gonna bounce off the top of a building or a bare surface earth or a tree. Uh, and then second, third, fourth, the numbers or the percentages obviously get lower uh, with each of those returns. Uh, you're only gonna get a fourth return under a fairly um, light uh, thickness tree, right? One where it can pass through a tree a couple of times. If it's a very thick or high density uh, forest, maybe like a rainforest, you're probably going to get a first or maybe a second return. And this here is actually a zoomed in model of a tree, a specific tree. 
So you can see the red along the top of the tree is all those are all first returns. Just below that, you can see the green. Those are second returns. Uh, third returns are sort of on the bottom side of the tree's foliage and also on the ground around it. Uh, and then fourth returns are very, very minimal, very few. Uh, this here is showing the height, uh, probably in centimeters, I would imagine, maybe maybe inches actually. Uh, and so, yeah, we can see make those out basically low to high. And then here we have the classification system that I mentioned before. So you can see that the tree itself is all blue. That's class four. If you go back to that classification, you'd see that four is vegetation, uh, and class two would be ground. So first returns for the top of features, immediate intermediate returns for vegetation structure, and last returns and only returns for the ground and for buildings. You can see there first, intermediate, last, and only. So these are all different ways that you can render a point cloud. So you're not limited to just the physical object. You can also really tell something about the object, how big it is, uh, how dense it is, and so on and so forth. All right, so that concludes this week's lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, and until next time, have a good one. Bye-bye.